All right, hello everybody. And today we're going to be deriving an integral representation for our beta function. So if you've come across the beta function already, you've probably seen its nice relationship with the gamma function. So if you have beta of two variables, let's just call them x and y. You can actually rewrite this thing in terms of gamma functions. So you'll have gamma of x times gamma of y over gamma of x plus y, like so. And today we're going to be using this fact right here in order to find an integral representation for this beta function. So let's just go ahead and get started. What I'm going to take a look at first is just this numerator right here. So gamma of x times gamma of y, and we want to find some kind of expression for that. Let's take a look at gamma of x times gamma of y. We know that there's an integral representation for our gamma function, and let's actually use that on both these gammas right here. So on the first the gamma function, we're gonna have the integral from zero to infinity of, let's choose a variable, I'm gonna call it a t, and then we have t to this argument right here, minus one, then multiplied by e to the minus t dt. So that's our first gamma function, and for our second gamma function, we're gonna have the integral from zero to infinity, um, I'm going to choose a new variable, let's call it s, and then we have the argument y subtract 1 like the first one, and then we're going to have e to the minus s ds like so. And so now we're going to try to combine these two integrals a little bit. First of all, notice that we can kind of bring this integral right here with respect to t inside this integral, because this integral is basically just like any other constant with respect to s. So if we drag this onto the inside, we're going to get the integral from zero to infinity. This is still the integral with respect to s. Now we're gonna pull this guy into here. So putting this guy in, we're going to have the integral from zero to infinity, t to the x minus one, e to the minus t dt. So we've just pulled this integral in and we still have this stuff right here. So we're gonna multiply by s to the y minus one e to the minus s ds. All right, and now notice this inside integral right here is with respect to t, so we can pull this stuff that has s's and all that in, inside of this inner integral right here. So we're gonna have the integral from zero to infinity, integral from zero to infinity, t to the x minus one. And uh, let's just write this stuff in right now. So we're gonna have s to the y minus one, and then we're going to be combining these two exponential terms. And notice we can factor a negative on the exponent. So we're going to have e to the minus. And since we're multiplying two exponentials together, we can just add t and s together. So we're going to have e to the minus t plus s, and then dt ds like so. All right, and now we have this double integral right here. And what I'm going to do now is a change of variables. So I'm going to put side notes right here, um, and we're going to be doing a particular substitution that works out quite nicely. We're going to let our t, this variable t right here, be the product of two new variables, let's call them u and v, and we're going to let our s be equal to um, u times 1 minus v like so. And if you just play around with um, these equations a little bit, you'll find that s is equal to u minus u times v, but hey, u times v is exactly t, so in fact, s is equal to u minus t, and if you rearrange this, you're actually going to get s plus t is equal to u. And in fact, this is kind of where this substitution comes from, you kind of want to substitute t plus s for a new variable. Alright, so we have all of this information right now, and uh, let's actually find out what the new upper and lower bounds will be. So first of all, let's look at this equation right here. S plus T is equal to U. We know that a T runs from zero to infinity and S runs from zero to infinity. So if um, T is between zero and infinity and S is between zero and infinity as well, that means that if we add these two domains together, kind of, U is also going to be in between zero and infinity. And another way to write this is just use some positive number. All right, so we know that u is definitely 
greater than zero, but how about our new variable v? Well, to find this out, we're going to be taking a look at this equation right here. S is equal to u times 1 minus v. I'm going to manipulate this equation a little bit. Let's bring this down here. Let's factor out a negative in here. So we're going to have S is equal to negative u. And then since we've factored out a negative right here, we're just going to change the order in here. So we're going to have v minus 1 like so. And we want to find out what the values for our v are the domain of our v. And um, to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch out a little graph. Let's put it right here. So we can imagine this is our v axis and this is our s axis like so. And um, u, u is just some positive number. And if you look at this equation right here, this is basically some kind of linear relation between s and v. And you see here we have negative u but u is actually a positive number just like we said before so in fact this is telling us that we have a negative gradient so our gradient is going to be sloping down like this and v is being shifted one unit to the right so if you don't have the shift right here we're going to be intercepting at zero zero but because we have this extra shift right here minus one we're going to be shifting to the right so in fact our x intercept or our v intercept in this case is just going to be one zero like so and so now with this picture we can kind of see what our v should be we know that s is um, between zero and infinity. So we're only interested in this portion of the graph right here because if V was more than one, S would be negative and we don't want S to be negative. So from this graph, we can conclude that in order for S to be um, positive, we must have a V being less than one. So we know V is less than one. But um, we're not quite there yet because there's also another restriction we need to take into account. If you look over back right here, t is equal to u times v. We have t is positive, u is also positive. So that means v must also be positive because if v was negative, then t would have to be negative or u would have to be negative as well. But both of these things are positive, so therefore v must be positive. And to see that clearer, you can kind of rearrange this if you divide both sides by u. So we're going to have v is equal to um, t over u. Both t and u are positive, so therefore a quotient of two positive numbers is also a positive number. So therefore v must also be greater than zero. So now you see we've found our new upper and lower bounds for our u and v. So let's write them somewhere over here. So we have u is between zero and infinity and v is between 0 and 1. Alright, so we have all this information right here. We can throw it back into the integral if we want to and keep solving from there, but we're actually missing one important little thing, namely a kind of scaling value for our differentials right here. Because if you have a look at the single variable case of substitution, if you let our x, so if we have an integral in terms of x, if you let x be equal to some new function of u, you can plug this back in, but you also need to change the dx's into du's. And to do that, you just differentiate both sides. So dx over du is equal to f prime of u. And from here, you can say that dx is f prime of u du. So you see, we're going from our old variable right here to our new variable. But in doing so, we need to multiply by this extra scaling factor, which is in this case, f prime of u. And we need to do the same thing um, for our multivariable case. In this case, we have two variables. We need to find what exactly is dt ds in terms of du dv. There must be some kind of scaling factor that we need, need to figure out. And that's exactly the Jacobian determinant that we need to find. So basically the equivalent of what we're trying to do in the single variable case in the multivariable case, for this step right here, we're actually trying to find the scaling factor right here. And to find that, we need to find how our um, variables t and s, so our old variable t and s, remember this is our old variable. So we need to find how our t and s change with respect to our new variable. So this is the new variable right here, which in this case is u and v. 
So we need to find how our TNS changed with respects to U and V. And that's exactly the Jacobian determinant. I'll um, write it as absolute value of J. So actually taking the absolute value of the Jacobian determinant. And um, this thing's not too hard to calculate. We're just gonna be taking the absolute value of a matrix full of a bunch of derivatives. So we're gonna have the matrix um, del t with respect to u. So basically here, we're taking our first variable t and differentiating with respect to u. Then we're gonna have our first variable t again, but now we're differentiating with respect to v. Then we're gonna grab our second variable, our second old variable, and differentiate with respect to the first variable, so del u s. And we're going to grab our second variable again and differentiate with respect to v and find the determinant of that. All right, cool. So this is what we have to calculate right now. This is not too hard. We already have the equations and everything right here. So in order to find this, let's find del t del u. So derivative of t with respect to u, that's going to give us v. And then derivative of t with respect to v, this is a variable, so we're just gonna be left with u. And then here, derivative of s with respect to u. U is a variable. So in fact, when you differentiate this, you're gonna be left with one minus V. And then derivative of S with respect to V, let's actually use this equation right here. It's a bit um, easier to see. If you differentiate this thing with respect to V, this is a constant, so it's gonna to go to zero. Then we have this extra factor up here of negative U. So computing the determinant of that, that's pretty easy. We're going to get the absolute value AD, which is minus UV minus bc, which is minus u, I'm gonna expand it out right now, so minus u, and then plus u times v, because we have a double negative. And notice this and that will cancel out, leaving us with the absolute value of minus u, which will just be u in this case. So what did we just find out? We just found out that our Jacobian determinant, the absolute value of that, is just equal to u like so. So we have that now, and now we can kind of chuck this differential thing onto the other side to get that dt ds is equal to u du dv like so. All right, so we've pretty much figured out our scaling factor, and we know how our differentials relate um, with our old variables and our new variables as well. So now we can chuck everything back into the integral. So first of all, we're going to have the integral. Um, and another integral, and notice the order right here, the order matters, so we're starting with u and this v. So that means our inner integral right here is with respect to u, so u is going to go from zero to infinity. Our outer integral v is going to go from zero to one, and then t is exactly u times v, so we're going to have u. I'm gonna kind of expand everything out, so if you have a product raised to this power right here, you can split it up a little bit, so I'm gonna have u to the x minus one, times v to the x minus one, and then we're going to have s, which is now u times one minus v, same deal, we're going to have u to the y minus one, and then one minus v to the y minus one, like so, and then e to the minus, remember t plus s is exactly u right here, so we're going to have e to the minus u, and then um, let's rub all this stuff out because we don't need it anymore. dt ds will turn into u du dv. So u du dv like so. All right, this is a bit of a mess, but we can kind of clean things up nicely actually. Notice that our inner integral is with respects to u. So everything that has a v in it can literally just jump out to the outside like a constant. So now we have the integral from zero to one. We're gonna put everything that has v in it right here. So this has V in it, um, this has V in it, and that is pretty much all the V terms, I think. So we're gonna have V to the X minus one, one minus V to the Y minus one, and then integral from zero to infinity, and then everything else that remains. So we're gonna have this, this, and this, and notice those all have base U. So we can actually combine the exponents together. So we're going to have U, x minus one plus one right here so this is u to the one that's going to give us u to the x and we also have u to the y minus one so we're going to have x plus y minus one like so and we have this e to the minus u 
And then we have du dv like so. And notice uh, this insole right here looks um, pretty familiar if I go back up um, near the top right here again. Notice that this in school, this inner in school, has the same form as either of these in schools right here. We have our integration variable, in this case it's u, to something minus 1 and then e to the minus u. Same thing up here, we have t to the something minus 1, e to the minus t. And um, this in school is just gamma of x. And this integral right here is also the gamma function of something. And that something is actually x plus y. So we can rewrite this whole thing as being the integral from 0 to 1, v to the x minus 1, 1 minus v to the y minus 1, times this thing right here is actually gamma of x plus y. So gamma function, x plus y, and then we have our dv. And gamma of x plus y is independent of v, so we can chuck that out to the outside. And let's go back to the top here again to finish things off. From here, we can conclude that everything, so this product of integrals right here, that is equal to gamma of x plus y times the integral from 0 to 1 of v to the x minus 1, 1 minus v to the y minus 1, dv and um, let's actually just change the variables right here just so things look a bit nicer because um, usually we don't have v's flying around in intervals we have nice t's and uh, yeah we just showed that the product of gamma functions gamma of x times gamma of y is equal to this weird thing right here gamma of x plus y times this integral and um, if you divide both sides by gamma um, of x plus y you're going to find that the integral from 0 to 1 of t to the x minus 1, 1 minus t to the y minus 1 dt is equal to gamma of x times gamma of y over gamma of x plus y. And hey, that's exactly the beta function of x and y. So in fact, what did we just show right here? We just found an integral representation of our beta function. Beta of x, y is equal to the integral from 0 to 1 t to the x minus 1, 1 minus t to the y minus 1 dt. And um, that is the result for today's um, video. We have our integral representation for our beta function. And this thing right here is really useful. I'm going to be using it in a future video actually, where I will prove the Euler reflection formula. So yeah, stay tuned for that. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. Um, and uh, yeah. That is pretty much it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And yeah, until next time, hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone later. Bye bye.